Well, all right, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody. Another episode of Legend Sports and Amplify. And we're talking baseball history, Negro League history, minor league history, collections, card art, you name it. Um, and I am really, really happy to have on tonight uh, Professor Rob Ruck, uh, author, historian. How are you doing, sir? Doing real good. How about you, Phil? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And you're. Uh, we were talking before we got on here. You're over in Pittsburgh at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm a former PA guy, so spent many, many times going. I went to Penn State myself, so I'm kind of a rival uh -huh. Pitt, but <laughs> but uh, many, many, many times I've been over to Pittsburgh, and I, I love the city. I love that part of the state. I, I'm a Pennsylvania guy. I, I really do love Pennsylvania. I don't know if I'd go back and live. I'm down here in Texas. The winters are tough, but uh, I do uh, I do miss Pennsylvania quite a bit at times for sure. So. Uh, Thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about your your uh, your research, your books, uh, some of the other things that you've got going on. Um, uh, one of the things that I've been, when I talk to people about this, and I mentioned this before we got on here, uh, I'm trying to get the backstory, the the context to the Negro League uh, announcements that have been going on in the last you know six months or so. Uh, to try to get those authors and researchers and those connections so people could understand them. And I've had on quite a number of authors and historians like yourself on here. And, and uh, this, new, this connection with the Latin Leagues is what we're going to talk about tonight. But what I'm always talking about with people, which I think is great, is how did you get into this? What's, what's the origin story? How did you find your way into writing books about, you know, uh, black baseball in Pittsburgh and baseball in the Caribbean? You know, the, the answer to that question, it depends on how far back you want to go. <laughs> um, I think it's probably significant that I moved to Pittsburgh in 1960, the year the Pirates won the pennant and then the World Series. Uh -huh. And had Roberto Clemente in right field. Um, and by that time, of course, like most kids my age, I was a, a pretty ardent baseball fan. Um, but I think why I ended up researching and writing about the Negro Leagues and Latin baseball had a lot to do with the civil rights movement in Vietnam mm -hmm. and that affecting the kind of decisions I made with what to do in my life. Awesome. And at a certain point, um, after finally finishing college and ending about a year and a half in which I was in court, um, <sighs> both as a defendant and as a plaintiff against the police and the DA and the Fraternal Order of Police during the Vietnam War. Wow. Um, the enthusiasm and energy of the left, the new left, was ebbing. And I didn't think I wanted to drive a cab forever. So I wandered into grad school and was doing labor and social history, intending to write a dissertation about the rise and fall of the Union and Steel. Mm -hmm. that's beginning to look like an extended obituary. Mm -hmm. I'm in grad school. I start in the fall of 75. And that is an incredible decade in Pittsburgh sport. Mm -hmm. When the mills go down, but the Pirates come back in 71 and 79. Pitt wins a national football championship. And the Steelers win four titles in six years. Mm -hmm. So sport is, is just as intense as it could possibly be in the culture of the city. And we've become, by the end of the decade, we're no longer the steel city, but the city of champions. Right. One day I'm on a run with a buddy of mine who had grown up outside of Pittsburgh in a coal mining patch called Hermony Number no. 2, where the black miners and their families lived. And this friend, Norris Coleman, had gone off to the University of Illinois to play football, but like many African-American athletes at that era, didn't graduate while playing ball, but came back and graduated at Pitt. And we're running in a park where you can look across the Monongahela River to what was then the Homestead Steelworks. Mm -hmm. And I think Norris mentioned, wasn't there a ball club, a black ball club with associated with the Homestead Steelworks, the Homestead Grays. 
And I had heard about a little of Satchel Page and Josh Gibson. And Norris had been raised on stories from the old timers in Harmony Number no. Two about Cool Papa Bell and Buck Leonard. And his mother had always admonished him to become a Jackie Robinson. And we were amazed. We didn't know anything really about these guys. Mm-hmm. We went to the library, and other than Bob Peterson's Only the Ball Was White, there really wasn't much done elsewhere. Mm-hmm. That led to a grant with the National Endowment for the Humanities to find as many of the people connected with the Negro Leagues and Sandlot teams in Pittsburgh from which they grew. Wow. And, interview and keep get that story down. It became my dissertation. Uh, Norris went on to law school and became a judge. Uh, but I was hooked. And that um, became a book, Sandlot Seasons, eventually a documentary. Um, and I realized that there was a story there about the role the sport had played prior to integration. And not only why integration was so important and so long overdue, but what was lost with integration. And that led me to that led me to the Caribbean, because the 1930s Pittsburgh Crawfords were basically destroyed in the summer of 1937, when Satchel, Josh, Cool Papa Bell, and six other guys head down to the Caribbean to play ball in the Dominican Republic. That's right. So, you know, there's a lot of serendipity and chance Mm -hmm. in what I've done, as with most people's lives. And that's what led me into the Caribbean. It's interesting uh, what you said, though, because there is something about this story, and and I I felt it when I met some of these guys. um, It's 30 years ago now. Very few, if any of them, are still left, but... Um, back in the 90s, I got to meet Josh Gibson Jr., Jimmy Crutchfield, Buck O'Neill. Uh, there were several others that were at a benefit that we had at um, Lackawanna County Stadium in in Scranton. And, you know, it was only half the story, I mean, that I had known, and I thought I knew baseball. But once I heard it, I wanted to find out more. Uh, it just was a story to me that it's a story of, you know, overcoming and perseverance and and everything that went into it despite everything that was against them all those years uh it's just a story that everybody i I think you know i would hope should appreciate and then when i found out in talking to people recently about that really deep connection that the latin baseball has with the negro leagues it was the pipeline into the uh United States, which eventually became the pipeline into Major League Baseball, and and it's it's just you know there's the three triangle the, the triangle the three sides to that that you know I, I'm trying to I'm hoping some of these stories that I'm talking to uh, authors and researchers like yourself can start to fill in some of the some of these details that I'm sure most people do not know. <laughs> so uh, I've got your three books that you've that I've got ready here. And we touched on this a little bit, the Sandlot Seasons in Pittsburgh. Um, there were a lot going on, you know, with the, they call, you know, the Great Migration, right? They, they, they talk about where, where many uh, African Americans are coming from the South to cities in the North. And people talk about Chicago, you know, as one of them. But Pittsburgh, what, what was the, you know, was it the mills? What was, what was the connection with Pittsburgh? You know, I think Pittsburgh, Um, role in black baseball, which particularly in the 1930s and 40s um, is really as the crossroads of the black game, has a lot to do both with the way in which teams emerged from the grassroots, along with two amazing people who end up owning those two clubs, the Homestead Grace and Pittsburgh Crawfords. And I'll get to that, but the other thing is simply geography. Everybody travels by rail in those mm-hmm. days. And if you want to go from the east of the United States, from New York, Philadelphia, Boston, to the Midwest, to Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, Kansas City, you pass through Pittsburgh. And every ball club, every performer, every speaker would stop and play Pittsburgh along the way. 
But the other thing I think that's critical and is it serendipity? I don't know. But you have two ball clubs that emerge from the grassroots. One is the Homestead Craze, which begins around the turn of the century as a group of skilled black steel workers, many from the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, who have at that time, um, amazingly enough, skilled jobs. They're not simply working in the labor gangs. Um, and that was kind of an historic anomaly. They would largely disappear by the 1920s, those skilled positions for blacks. But these guys form a club and one of the people they recruit before World War I is wow. a young Homestead native, Cumberland Posey Jr. His father is a fairly, he's the most prominent black businessman in Pittsburgh. And Cum Posey is this terrific all around athlete. And Posey will be a star player for the Grays and then become their captain, manager, and ultimately owner. Wow. Meanwhile, um, during the Great Migration, there is a change in the demographics of the Black community. Um, now, a lot of the migrants are coming from the deeper South, from what's known as the Black Belt, from Alabama, from Georgia, where Josh Gibson is from. Uh, more rural than the earlier migration from the northern parts of the South, like the Shenandoah Valley. And a lot of them gravitate to the Hill District in the middle of the city, which is the historic gathering point for immigrants. And these kids um, have a class difference, socioeconomic, educational difference. Um, their understanding of urban life differs from that older, earlier black migration that forms the Homestead Grays. A bunch of these kids form a team. Uh, they're sponsored by the Crawford Bathhouse on the Hill, which helps white and black immigrants and migrants adjust uh, to urban life. Interesting. And eventually they become a great Sandlot club, which happens to recruit a kid from the north side of Pittsburgh named Josh Gibson, <laughs> who Harold Tinker, their center fielder and captain saw playing one day. And they get better and better. They have a rivalry with the Grays. And eventually, the Crawfords get involved with a fellow named Gus Greenlee. Greenlee was a migrant from North Carolina, was over in Europe fighting in World War I, ran hmm. uh, liquor during Prohibition, opened up nightclubs wow. on the hill. Um, his Crawford grill is a mecca for jazz. The kids go to Greenlee and they say, there's a white guy who wants to put us on a payroll. We'd rather go to a black man. Greenlee talks with his good buddy, Art Rooney, decides to take these kids on, uh, buys them uniforms, gets a couple of cars where they can travel in, brings in Bobby Williams, who had been a Negro leaguer to manage them. He brings in Satchel and other players. Wow. And you have this amazing era with the Homestead Grays and the Pittsburgh Crawfords battling it for about a decade or so. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that the Grays story goes back as far as you just talked about. I mean, you always hear in in many of the, you know, literature and, and, and research the articles that you read about the Homestead Grays, most of it centers on the 30s when, um, you know, they're already an established team, they're in the Negro Leagues, they, they already have established players like Josh Gibson and so forth. Uh, I had no idea that they go back all the way to the turn of the century as a, a Sandlot club. That is very cool. That is very, very cool. I, I, the, uh, the start of both of those teams is fascinating. I think both the, the Grays and the Monarchs, the Kansas City Monarchs, are really the two franchises that last for an incredibly long mm -hmm. amount of time. The Grays are more like a skyrocket that go up and burn brightly, but then are torn apart by what happens in the Dominican. 
So um, this book, Race Ball, um, is kind of like this bridge that we're you're, we're talking about, right? This is this, this is you go into how um, Major League Baseball um, and the kind of the confluence of the Negro Leagues, Latin Baseball, and Major League Baseball. Yeah. Um, after I did Sandlot Seasons, I wrote a book, Tropic of Baseball, about baseball in the Dominican Republic. And then followed those books up with documentaries, uh, Kings on the Hill, Baseball's Forgotten Men, about the Negro Leagues. Uh-huh. And it focuses on the tour and has not just people you know, like Satchel Page and Buck Leonard in it talking, uh, and people from the grassroots, but two Pittsburgh natives, playwright August Wilson, who's play Fences, is about a former Negro leaguer, and Rhodes Scholar uh, winning novelist, John Edgar Wideman. Hmm. The other documentary, which I did with a fellow named Dan Manat, was about the first generation of Dominicans to hit the majors called Republic of Baseball. And I really did not think I would ever write another book about baseball after all that. (laughs) And then an editor from Beacon Press came to me and said, can you put those two stories together? Uh And I thought about it. um, I said, well, give me a chance till I've got a a happy ending to this book I was working on with my wife, Maggie Patterson, which is a biography of Art Rooney. Uh-huh. And when we had a publisher, I wrote a proposal for Beacon, and that became Race Ball. Uh, but I don't want to write about baseball anymore. You're done writing about baseball? Now you, Enough already. <laughs> so you said you were just down in the, in the Dominican, right? Researching, yeah, I, though. Let me put up yeah, the, uh... I'm contradicting myself right away. Um, <laughs> I want to write a book about youth and global sport, and I call it Youth in the Republic of Play. And what I want to do in that book would be a couple of things. Explain why sport has become such a mixed blessing for so many kids in so many parts of the world, where basically they become... Uh, disposable commodities on a global supply chain and start having injuries that teenagers shouldn't be having because of overuse where we, we overtrain and overdevelop kids at a younger and younger age if they have potential and then tell the other kids become couch potatoes, which is why we have record obesity and why sport is so screwed up whether it's um, sport in the inner city, junior hockey, football academies in Africa, baseball academies in the Caribbean. And like, I don't think that's a hard story to explain Mm -hmm. or unfortunately at this point document. But I also want to find places where it's done better in healthier ways and see to what degree they could be models for other countries Places where I think sport is done in healthier ways tend to be small and tend to be affluent. But what about them could be translated into what happens in a bigger, poorer society? And I also want to look at problems in sport that people have tackled and reformed. So one of the problems I've seen in the Caribbean over the years is that the game has become an industry And because of two realities, one is that kids in the Caribbean, except for Puerto Rico, are not subject to the annual major league draft. Mm -hmm. And there's a signing age. A kid cannot sign traditionally until July 2nd of the year he turns 17. That means these kids are free agents when they're signed. And it also means MLB can't sign them till they're plus 16. So every major league team has an academy in the Dominican Republic, a relatively state-of-the-art operation. Mm -hmm. Once they sign kids, they might have 40 to 60 Dominican kids, plus Venezuelans and Nicaraguans and Colombians who are playing in the Dominican Summer League, which has about 1,600 to 1,800 players. 
It's the biggest league in baseball history. These are professionals. And if you're lucky, you'll make it off the island. Mm -hmm. But you've got, if you've got a couple of thousand kids who've been signed and are in the minor leagues, where Dominicans alone make up about 30% of all minor leaguers, you've got tens of thousands of kids, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, trying to get signed mm -hmm. when they're signing eligible. And they're being trained by independent trainers. And there's over a thousand of them in the Dominican. Wow. Some are people who simply might have a little league team. And if they see a promising 11 or 12 year old, they connect that kid with an agent who has an operation and get a speculative piece of the action if that kid is ever signed by an MLB club. And when that happens, the person who signs them usually gets 30 to 35 percent of the signing bonus. Wow. Other operations are, I was at three of them. One was by a, a Canadian, one by a um, Dominican born in the DR, but had to go to the Bronx when his father fled the country for political reasons. The third was a Dominican who grew up in Boston, who came back. And they've got millions of dollars sunk into their operations. So mm. what I have noticed over the years, but you know, a decade ago, you had all this abuse going on, not just um, kids being ripped off when they signed, but trainers giving kids veterinary steroids to pump them up. Wow. We're, doc we're changing their birth documents mm -hmm. so they appear younger. Because once you're 17 or 18, you're too old mm -hmm. in MLB Scout's eyes. <laughs> I wanted to see what, would ha what was happening with education. And I'm happy to say from what I could tell, Major League Baseball is doing a significantly better job educating the boys they sign and preparing them for the inevitable life after baseball which for 90 plus percent is not going to be mm -hmm. after the major leagues. They're never going to make it. Mm -hmm. Most of them will get cut before they leave the island. Mm -hmm. The problems that remain in that informal system of 1,000 or so trainers, and you've got amazing stuff going on. I heard at least four or five people tell me that major league scouts are verbally offering 11 and 12 year old boys contracts for four and $5 million. Oh my goodness. They can't legally sign that contract till after they're 16. So the scout can renege, but the trainer feels to maintain credibility, you've oh. got to keep that kid pledged to a team. I mean, it's kind of a bizarre, that is bizarre. system. That is so bizarre. I was down there hoping to see that things have gotten better. Because I think that's an important message to get across at a time when people are often resigned to the futility of reform and change. Mm -hmm. So how did we get to this point? How did baseball become such a commodity in the Dominican? I know it, it, it goes back I, in talking to Dr. Burgos, uh, you know, to um, at least... Um, you know, the turn of the century as well. But how did it get to this point? Because it, it is, like you pointed out, I mean, uh, the amount of uh, Dominican players in Major League Baseball is something like 10, 12, 14 percent at this point for such a small country. How did we get here? You know, I think it's important to understand there's two things going on. One is what the game meant historically. The other is how pervasive um, the growing corporatization of the game and the bottom line has been. Um, you know, Dominicans, the United States might be where baseball develops, but Cubans make it their own game mm -hmm. and then spread the game throughout the region. Mm -hmm. um, I remember this fellow, Pedro Julio Santana, telling me in the late 80s, when we're in his office, and he's probably in his 80s, overlooking in the colonial zone of Santo Domingo, the first Catholic cathedral where the bones of Christopher Columbus were reputedly buried. Wow. And he said, the North America, the Norte Americanos, which is how they refer to people from the United States, might have been the Jesus Christ of baseball. 
but the Cubans were the apostles who took the game and brought it here to Puerto Rico, to Venezuela and the like. And the game took hold and it became the Dominican game. And it was something that unified people. It was a, an upbeat uh, element of culture. Um, it helps them sustain occupation by the United States in during and after World War I and again in the 60s uh, to endure a 31 year long dictatorship by Rafael Trujillo. And it really becomes the story that Dominicans tell about who they are to the world. They're people who work hard and play harder, who lose but persevere, and in the end, beat the Yankees at their own game. <laughs> I mean, the best in the world at what they do, and exceedingly proud. At the same time, the Dominicans, like the entire Caribbean basin, uh, has to play by baseball's segregated rules. Mm -hmm. So if you are a Caucasian from the Caribbean or light enough to pass, you can play in the major and minor leagues of organized baseball. If you're unable to, you can play in the Negro leagues. So you have Dominicans like Horacio Martinez, um, who plays at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. And you have the Cuban Giants. You have all these guys in the Negro leagues. All of that changes with Jackie Robinson. Robinson opens the door for players of color from the Caribbean. And at first it's mostly Cubans, Orestes Minoso, it's Luis Aparicio. Oh no. In 1956. But the guy who really opens it up is Felipe Alou. Mm -hmm. And following Felipe, his brothers, Juan Marichal, Manny Moda, Julian Javier, and by the early 60s, they are a significant force in baseball, um, probably lagging behind Puerto Ricans. And of course, adding one other thing. After the Cuban Revolution in 1959, the U.S. basically shuts off relations, tries to blockade and embargo the island, pulls the Havana Sugar Kings Triple A team out, even though Fidel Castro tried to keep them in and remain a part of that baseball world. But when Cuba leaves it, the Dominican moves center stage. When I first went there to write about baseball in 1984, there were about 10% of all major leaguers were Latino. Mm -hmm. Half of them were Dominican from a nation of what was then under 6 million people. Now it's more than twice that. The population of the Dominican is about 11 million people. Um, and there's really never been anything like it in baseball. It, it's incredible. And the fact that uh, when I spoke with Dr. Burgos uh, last week, the roots that I have, you know, would have thought were the the way the uh, the game spread around the uh, Caribbean were not what I thought. Um, the it, they go back further than I ever thought they did, and they uh, uh, began in a way that I never would have anticipated. Because you, as an you know, as an American, you tend to hear certain ways that the game spreads and and how it goes from place to place. Turns out that that wasn't necessarily the way it, it was. You know, baseball history in this country has been largely from the perspective of the major leagues. Yep. That it was inevitable. That's the way it would turn out. <laughs> and I think what happens when you start to look at the role that sport plays in black America during segregation, you're not thinking, you know, yeah, the major leagues were segregated um, and that was pretty screwed up. But Black America creates its own baseball world that stretches into the Caribbean. And those teams, those Black teams, the best Black teams, are constantly playing white teams. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Homestead Grays might have played 250, 300 games a year against white Sandlot and semi-pro teams, visiting uh, barnstorming teams after the World Series. <clears throat> major leaguers and among and other black teams and it's the same with the caribbean um 
the Caribbean baseball world is focused on Cuba until Robinson changes the game. And it's a baseball world that includes Mexico, which has a really strong professional and commercial league where many Negro leaguers played. Um, the Pearl of the Antilles, not just for tourism, but baseball, of course, was Cuba until 59. Mm -hmm. So it's a di different story. And like you, many of the things I once thought I was mm -hmm. disabused of the more I spent time. That's right. I, I, I am I'm so glad to be having the authors and researchers uh, like yourself and Dr. Burgos, Dr. Brunson, Larry Lester, to come on here and tell these stories to give the context. Because one of the things I've been trying to point out, um, and, and again, with the, the context recently in the last six months or so, eight months, especially with Major League Baseball finally recognizing the Negro Leagues, the seven Negro Leagues as major leagues. Um, and, and people are trying to find out more now. And, and it, all of these stories give context because they, they, I, I, there's an underappreciated, I think, uh, view of the Negro Leagues and their role in spreading the brand of baseball as I, you know, uh, to every state, uh, every in Canada, all across the continent, and such a huge role in Latin America as well. Not only players playing there, but it was how Latin players found their way here. It, it, it's something that I, I, I think people, um, you know, I, I hope that they could wrap their head around the importance that the Negro Leagues had in spreading that baseball brand because it goes back a long way and it had a huge, huge impact that I don't think they often get as much credit as they should for. It goes a little bit further. Um, you know, of course, I teach this stuff, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to place it in context, context mm -hmm. for students. It's, it matters, and yes. I think that you can see in baseball um, a lot of the racial contradictions in this country and the uneven nature of racism, the fact that black and white kids on the hill in Pittsburgh uh, in the 1920s played together on the streets, on the sandlots, but when you got to more organized levels, they couldn't play together. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the convergence of the immigrant experience, the white working class experience, with that of the black migrant and black working class. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also see how much black America was able to create on its own, despite segregation, and how much was lost with integration when the Negro League collapsed. That was what I was going to ask you about next, was that aspect, because I've talked a little bit about it with people, with, with authors on here, but uh, that would be, uh, you know, to me, a story that people need to understand that as well, because in my mind, um, they had to know eventually once the color line was broken, what was going to happen, right? I mean, they, it, at some point, they, they it was not going to be sustainable because even fans of the Negro Leagues, black baseball, wanted to see their play, the players play in the majors. That was what it was all about. So they had to know that was coming. So did they prepare for it? How did that all fall out? I think most of the owners were okay with integration. I think the players were okay with integration. In fact, they wanted it even though they thought it would never come in their lifetimes. Hmm. I think what's important to consider is that integration could have played out in any number of ways. It did not play out in the optimal way. The Negro Leagues will lose their best young players as well as Satchel Paige in his twilight and some other older players, uh, uh, usually without compensation. Uh -huh. uh, they lose the focus and attention of the black press and of black fans. Now, that would probably have been inevitable, no matter how things played out. But the Negro Leagues also petitioned the major leagues to at least accept mm -hmm. some of their teams as franchises in the high minors. MLB never responds. Huh. There was no consideration of bringing in the New York Eagles, the Homestead Grays, the Kansas City Monarchs, which would have been viable contenders 
Yep. There was no integration of the front office, of coaching staffs, of managers. And instead what happens is hmm. that National Negro League uh, splutters to a stop after the 1948 season. As Buck Leonard famously said, after Jackie, we couldn't draw flies. Huh. You know, we couldn't get fans. Um, the Negro American League lasts a few more years playing more of a orange stormy Midwestern game where there are fewer major league ball clubs located. Um, they go under. And at the same time, after World War II, because of suburbanization, television, um, the growing wealth and power of individual teams, Sandlot and neighborhood baseball and local sport is dying. The minor leagues are contracting hmm. drastically. When that happens, if you're a black kid and you come up in baseball, you no longer have a black Sandlot team, a Negro League team, black mm -hmm. coaches and managers, and a mm -hmm. supportive network within which you can be nurtured right. and developed. Chances are you're going to go into a minor league team in the South where people are going to be threatening you and you're facing abuse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if they had sent Jackie Robinson and Roberto Clemente to a, a Southern minor league t town in those days, there would have been blood. Mm -hmm. Probably At so. the same time, colleges and universities except in the South, are opening up to black athletes with scholarships to play basketball and football. Mm -hmm. And that's a far better, more rational choice than playing minor league baseball. It's, it's just a much better career decision. And you start to see a decline of black players. Um, it peaks somewhere, you know, in the late 70s. But by the 90s, the numbers are declining. Uh, baseball loses cachet in the black community. It's not very popular these days. Um, the All-Star game the other night, mm -hmm. how many black players were there? Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, good. the Latin tide gets higher and higher. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That, <clears throat> that's an interesting dynamic to point out because... Um, you know, uh, it was more than just the Negro Leagues uh, that ended up being impacted by integration and, and Jackie Robinson coming. It trickles all the way down, like you just pointed out, to all the businesses associated with those teams, the minor league, the Sandlot teams, all the way down through the, the whole entire operation. That took a long time to build up. I mean, these teams, you know, some of the, the, the teams in, in many cities go back... Um, you know, well before the, the turn of the, you know, uh, the 20th century into the 1800s, that they were there existing and doing their thing. And now they don't have a, a means to uh, support. Uh, I, I could see the impact was huge. You know, think about play counterfactual history. Let's say the Newark Eagles, it's the Homestead Grays, and Kansas City Monarchs have been given expansion franchises. Could you imagine the black capital that mm -hmm. would have been a man and what that would mean in sport today, mm -hmm. where you still don't see much African-American ownership. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just another example of how segregation, manifold forms of discrimination, and the way in which integration occurred prevented the African-American community from developing a lot of the wherewithal mm -hmm. uh, that would give people jobs, provide investment capital, and the like. And right. we're still dealing with you know, slavery and discrimination's legacy uh, mm -hmm. in 2021, mm -hmm. even though I know that in some states you can't say that anymore. Right? I know. I'm in one. <laughs> yeah. The, I, <laughs> It's probably and, uh, the rest for this. Yeah, I know. I, I hear you. Um, but no, it, it's definitely the context that uh, you, you you have to wrap your head around that because, it, in a sense, they were cut out of everything. 
the ownership um, what did they do what what did the uh, ownership of the Crawfords and the Grays do once um, the the it was a downbound train and go heading into the 50s yeah. what happened um, you know Cumberland Posey died um, right after World War II when after Jackie Robinson had been signed before he was brought up to the Dodgers um, Gus Greenlee left baseball after the Crawfords fell apart because of the Dominican Republic, got into boxing big time, um, had a fighter, John Henry Lewis, who was the um, boxing, light okay. heavyweight champion of the world. Not the heavyweight, not Joe Lewis, but John Henry. Um, he then gets back into baseball and reforms the Crawfords during World War II and takes part in something called the United States League, having connections with Branch Rickey, the nature of which have never been very clear to me or I think any other scholar. Um, but then he gets out of baseball. Um, but there were other teams, Effie Manley and the Newark Eagles, um, the owners of the Kansas City uh, team, the Monarchs. Wilkinson. It's, it's, its owners, Wilkinson, was a white man, mm -hmm. um, but always had integrated teams back to the All Nations mm -hmm. ball club in the early 20th century. That's right. You know, I, I think they tried to um, sell players when they could, mm -hmm. when you found more ethical owners who would pay, um, but they saw the handwriting on the wall. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency to clump. And Major League Baseball had such stature in those days. Mm -hmm. And the emergence of black players, I mean, Robinson, Mignoso, Aaron, Banks, Campanella, uh, Mays. I mean, that cachet just was through the roof in those mm -hmm. days. That was a golden age. And you couldn't fight that. No, uh, it would not be easy for sure. Um, what happened to the stadium? Because one of the things about Pittsburgh and, and Gus, Gus Greenlee, was he, wasn't he the very first, um, it was the very first black-owned baseball stadium, wasn't it? You know, there are other black-owned stadiums, including one short-lived one in late 19th century Pittsburgh. Um, where there was a team called the Keystones. But when Gus took the Crawfords on and revitalized, actually he reformed the Negro League, National Negro National League, which collapsed in the, late in the early depression. And he reformed it. He built a ball club on the hill called Greenleaf Field. And that certainly was the finest um, black owned facility outside of black colleges, the HBCUs at the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, Pittsburgh Steelers uh, who were called Pittsburgh Pirates in their first season in 1933 and for a few more, trained and played exhibition games there before really? they got access to Forbes Field. Wow. Um, and Art Rooney was very tight with Gus Greenlee and with Cum Posey. But Cum Posey was Art Rooney's mentor and role model. As an really? Uh, but after Gus and the Crawfords fell apart, Crawfords fell apart, Gus didn't, uh, Greenlee Field was torn down and it became a city housing project, Bedford hmm. Dwellings, um, which then has been um, rehabbed and repurposed, uh, mm -hmm. but still is public housing today. It's, it's a historic bad. marker. That's too bad. Yeah, I, well, I've spoken. Uh, yeah, I've spoken with uh, several people. Uh, Gary Gillette, I had on last week, who's involved in the preservation of Hamtramck Stadium in uh, Michigan. Uh, I've had on Brian Powers. Uh, they're they're involved in uh, Rickwood Field in Birmingham, and then there's several others around it. The Hinchcliffe Stadium in Patterson, New Jersey, is another one that they're that they're refurbishing so there's efforts being made it's a shame that uh, it ended up uh, just going off <laughs> into the into the uh, 
sunset in Pittsburgh because that would have been a heck of a I mean just to to see it today would have been very very cool now you you've written uh it, it, you just mentioned about Art Rooney you you've written a you and that's your your wife as well have written books on football as well right the uh the Art Rooney book and then you've got another one that just came out recently right about um uh Samoans in the NFL which I thought was a very very interesting book as well uh, so you you you're not just baseball you write you write some other things as well <laughs> Well, but they're all connected. Yeah. One thing leads me to another. Yeah. So you were just down. So you were just down in the Dominican, you said, right? You're doing research for yeah. another book. I, I had the opportunity to go a couple of uh, years ago on vacation, and I moved them. But I have my. I I had to go see a Dominican baseball game because you can't go there. You hear so much about it. This is about five years ago, and so I saw Romano Toros play and uh, Aguila Ceballenas play. Um, my wife is formerly from, is from Guadalajara, so she's a Spanish speaker, so we have no problem down there. My boys are all bilingual, which is very, it's very, very good too. We can go to there and communicate. But one thing, the language, didn't matter how, how half and half my Spanish was, they all knew the language of baseball. I could talk to anybody about Juan Marichal. They're all giant fans, and they're all you know, Red Sox fans because of Big Poppy. And it, it just goes so deep there. And and it's no surprise they're as good as they are. I mean, those the kids there, I mean, today, just, just real quick on this. Um, the travel ball that's going on now, where it's like a pay-to-play thing, where you have to have the money to get your kids into the right travel team and will they play and blah, blah, blah. It was never like that when I was a kid, when you were a kid. Um, it was more like what I saw when I went to the Dominican. You found a field, a street, an alley, a stick and a ball, and you played. And that's how you got good at the game of baseball. Uh, I wish we would get more back into that. Baseball is a pretty expensive game. It is here. Uh, I saw kids playing there with milk, with milk jugs as gloves. I mean, it was, yeah. it was, it was, they, whatever they could use, they used. It was fascinating. One day, and this is back in the late 80s, I'm driving from Santo Domingo to Santiago to the heart of the country. And I just wanted to stop and take some pictures of cane fields. So I drove down this dirt road, and then there was an opening where some cane had been cut, and there's about 20 young boys playing baseball. Um, their bats are sticks or branches from trees. Uh, the ball might have been a golf ball with electrical tape on it. Um, you know, I remember this one. None of them have shoes on. Right. Uh, some of them, you know, the little kids don't have shorts or pants on. They just have a shirt, if anything, but they're playing ball. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it might not even have been a ball. It might have been something that was shaped like a ball, <laughs> but yeah. they were playing the game. And I, I, that's how you got good. When I, when I was a kid, I, I would leave, on a, in, on a, especially in the summertime, as soon as the sun came up, you were gone. And my parents didn't know what I was doing, but most of the time we were playing a football, baseball, mostly baseball. And we didn't come back as long as we came back before the speed you know, before it got dark they didn't care it's a small town right you couldn't get in any trouble anyway because if you did something they would you my parents you would know about it before you got home anyway so you really you couldn't get away with anything but it was more what i remember you just got up your neighborhood and your kids and, and and you played wherever you could find and that is what just I, I saw it all around me uh, when I was in the Dominican. That was how they played, and I imagine it's it's probably like that in other Latin countries as well. I mean, when I had uh, Adrian Burgos on here, uh, he's doing the, the Smithsonian that play ball um, exhibit that's going on about the the roots of the Latin game, and it's 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 a I think a great representation of um, that's the way baseball. I think is meant to be. I mean, and why it goes so deep in in Latin countries. But again, you know, it all ends up tracing back to some Negro League roots, which which is really uh, an interesting aspect that I don't. I think people are are not really as aware of as they should be. So, so what are you working on now? You you went down there doing some research. Can you tell us about what your uh, what your well, uh, 
the, the big project is this global project that I mentioned before, Youth in the Republic of Play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could write from my own experience working on these books, why sport is so messed up in a number of places. But I want to go to Norway and New Zealand, where I think it's done in healthier ways. Um, I probably would like to get to a sport huh. for development program in Africa to use as a model to show the kinds of ways in which people are using sport. Fascinating. Uh, get kids in school to not be infected by AIDS, uh, for boys and girls to respect each other and themselves, uh, to build social capital. And I'd like to get uh, to the United Arab Emirates to see if wow. camel racing. <laughs> um, oh, wow. In short, this traditional sport of the Bedouin people who are throughout North Africa, the Middle East, the Gulf, um, racing camels. Interesting. The camel is the mainstay of their oh. lives. Um, <laughs> but those races, which have been going on for a millennium, were races for status and ceremony, um, not for money. Mm -hmm. Oil wealth basically marginalizes the camel and the Bedouin. The sheikhs, uh, realizing they could be losing their political legitimacy, pour money into camel racing. Wow. It's part of cultural heritage revival, but they make it a multi million dollar industry wow. where a prize racing camel will go for over a million dollars US. As that happens, in, and the number of racing camels grow, no longer are Bedouin youth riding those camels. Instead, they're bringing in kids as young as three and four years old from Pakistan, India, Baluchistan, uh, wow. Sudan, Mali, who are prized as riders once you teach them because they're light and they make the camels faster. Wow. But often they're working 16 to 18 hour days on the camel farms. These kids are sometimes trafficked, sometimes sold by desperately poor parents. Um, their childhood is over. However, efforts by anti-slavery international, um, by a Bangladeshi Women Lawyers Association, the International Labor Organization, scathing documentaries uh, by Canadian, Australian TV, as well as HBO, put pressure on the shakes and led the State Department to act and reform camel racing. The problem is I've got to see it to believe it. Mm -hmm. I need to get there to make sure those reforms have taken hold. And I want to go to the camel farms and see what's happened there. And they're in the remote desert. So they're out of the scrutiny of most people. Um, and it's like the Dominican. What I'm hoping is that, yeah, reform happened, kids are being treated better, which I think reinforces the notion um, that it is possible to do something and make things better. Did you ever think a uh, coming out of the 60s that you would one day be uh, researching camel racing <laughs> in the Middle East. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> was on the radar, that's for sure. Was not on your radar, I'm sure, yeah. But you know what? It sounds like, uh, I mean, you, you have written so many fascinating uh, studies on certain topics that I hope people take the time to check them out, the Tropic of Baseball, the, the uh, race ball. I mean, to understand the context, because it's important, and, and you said it as well. I, you have to understand the whole story, and most of the time people are only fed, um, you know, very little if, if high level at all. And, and, and when it comes to some of these topics, um, most people I talk to know very, very little about which is why I'm hoping that these conversations I'm having get people to look around. You know, there's there's uh, there's more to this than than uh, always what you're 
seeing in in in, in the media sometimes, and and it's it's interesting. So I I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here and do this. This was fascinating. I I, I learned I learned so much. You know, just in this hour we were on here about Pittsburgh, uh, you know, the history of Pittsburgh baseball, uh, you know, Dominican baseball. Twelve-year-old kids being offered million-dollar contracts. I mean, that just blows my mind. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying so. I, I, uh, I, I appreciate your work, man. I, I really, I think it's fascinating. It's been fun. It's been a fun way to live my life. I bet. Um, and you get to talk to kids in class about issues connected to sport, but which transcends sport. Mm -hmm. uh, how much I'm getting across, who knows? Um, but I think and and so you are. That is a class, That is what you're teaching, right? The history of sport. Is is that the actual title of the class, or is that a, a major a what? History of sport class and history of sport and global capitalism course as well. Oh, okay. We've recently created a sports studies certificate at Pitt uh, that's multidisciplinary, but has a lot of history. Ah. And as well as a, a third course taught by a colleague of mine, uh, Leanne Sukas, about gender, women, and sport. Um, you know, kids are interested in, in sport. Yes. And if they're interested in something, they're willing to talk about other things like class and race and colonialism that they might not be so receptive to mm -hmm. in other situations. No, that's a great point because it, it kind of is a... A, uh, a subject that most people are are positive about mostly <laughs> so you can approach other topics through that lens and maybe be a little less uh, you know I don't know I don't want to say it's not offensive but a little less uh, obtrusive you know when, <laughs> when it comes to how you approach certain uh, certain subjects I, I think it makes it more uh, more palatable for people to uh, to maybe take a look at something from a different angle if sport is the way that they approach it. So, yeah, it's a great. So, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. This was great. Uh, I think um, maybe down the road when you get your book, your other books done or anything, if you're you're more than welcome, I'd love to have you come back on here again. And if there's anybody else you can think of, because as I've been doing this, I've been, uh, you know, finding out there's someone else who did something and there's someone else who did something because there's such a limited number of authors and researchers on some of these topics and many of them have go back a long time and I'm trying to encourage and that's why it's great I'm you know I'm glad that there are kids who are taking the history of sport but I'm trying to there's got to be the next generation of this and I'm hoping that there's people out there that are going to find an interest like I saw 30 years ago in this. And I never did it, you know, for a living or anything like that. But uh, to take that next step and start doing the research. Because with all these announcements in re recent about the Negro Leagues, there's going to be a lot that people can dig into. Uh, it, it goes... Um, you know, from the statistical side to the to the uh, the history side, the bio biographical side of players and teams and franchises, there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot of great people out there doing it. But I think we need more. So I'm hoping that people get uh, get more encouraged and get into this. So, but again, I, I thank you. Me. All right, I thank you for your time. This is great, and uh, we'll touch base again down the road. Definitely. All right, well. man. Thank you. You too. Bye bye.